Um, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I was going to start off by um, thanking um, Diane for holding this great event, but since we're behind schedule, I'm going to skip that part if, if that's okay with you. <laughs> All right. So, um, <clears throat> quick introduction. Um, uh, my name is Eero Arvonen. Um, I'm currently working for Suomen Asiakastieto. Uh, I've been with Asiakastieto since early 2016. Uh, my background is in Java development, and um, currently I spend my time about 50-50 uh, between doing, you know, projects, software projects, and um, doing other cool stuff like um, improving our CI/CD pipeline or um, trying out new technology. So I'm presenting Suomen Asiakastieto, which is part of um, Asiakastieto Group alongside uh, a company called UC. Um, we are listed on the Helsinki Stock Exchange. Now, we are among the leading providers of business and consumer information services in the Nordics. Um, within the Nordic markets, we are a data powerhouse. We are quite good at collecting data and um, building services that utilize this data. <coughs> um, we are also a fintech company, and we help our finance clients um, enhance their business opportunities by bringing new data innovations to the market. Um, and our largest customer segment is, uh, segments rather, are banking and finance, uh, insurance. And in brief, our products are, and, and services are primarily used for stuff like risk management, finance, uh, administration, decision making, sales, marketing, that type of thing. And um, our goal is to um, <coughs> deliver automated and accurate uh, services for these functions. Now, um, why should you listen to me instead of reading emails and Twitter for the next 30 minutes? Uh, here's why. I'm going to tell you why a company like us is interested in, or rather decided to jump into the open banking space. I'm going to tell you about the product that we've already built and, and launched. I'm going to demonstrate to you what it does, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, the design choices that we put into it. I'm also going to take a look into the future and speculate on what uh, kind of products we're going to see going forward. And finally, I'll show you how I took our um, open banking product account insight um, to the next level by migrating it onto Quarkus, which is a framework for um, cloud-native Java. <laughs> and uh, here's some pretty picture our marketing department conjured up. So after the uh, financial crisis, uh, we've had plenty of brand new regulation um, in the financial sector. Um, you can see all the acronyms here on the right. There's you know, K KYC, there's anti-money laundering, GDPR, and most recently we have the um, PSD2. Now, for Asiakastieto, um, oh, shoot. Um, this uh, new regulation brings new business in, in two distinct ways. Um, first off, banks have more need for our existing risk management uh, services because regulation demands it now. And uh, secondly, and this is the case with, with um, the PSD2 and the account inside, is that um, we are getting access to new data sets which we can leverage to build better products, uh, new products. Um, now, financial institutions are getting the short end of the stick uh, in that this will drive up their costs and um, this might disrupt their business models. So, what fintechs like us need to offer is automated solutions um, based on these new data sets via scalable technology. And since we are competing in a highly regulated market, uh, complying with the regulation is key. So it all kind of started several years ago uh, by us investigating what changes PSD2 will bring and how it will affect our clients and um, our business with them. So. After that, after studying it for a couple of years, our clients actually started asking us for solutions on, on like what, what they should build on, on top of this um, new regulation and uh, whether we can present them with business opportunities. 
And now we are at the stage where our version 1.0 has been launched and the first customers are live and we are starting to build even more stuff on top of it. And next up, we are looking to improve the service, uh, connect it to other services and um, see if we can't find some more business cases with it. So then, um, a few words about the service we've built, Account Inside. Um, yeah, we're, now we're getting to the part uh, which I'm qualified to actually speak on. Um, <clears throat> I would say any product that aims to be a great product has to have some sort of a um, impact in, in, in society. And uh, we did try and build a product that is really great, so let's have a one, one, um, one slide recap of what it is that we do. Uh, Asiakasat fights against over-indebtedness in Nordics, uh, as, a, as a short summary. So, this is what our service does. Okay, this was supposed to come one by one. But basically, we access bank accounts of a loan, the, the bank accounts of a loan applicant, uh, hence worth known as PSU or payment service user, based on their consent, yeah? We process the bank account data in the context that they've chosen on behalf of the creditor, that is the one where, uh, where they are you know, applying for loan at. We deliver actionable facts regarding the applicant's financial behavior from this data, and we all do all this in a compliant way. Uh, yeah. So how does um, bank transaction data um, create value? How do we create value out of bank transactions? Um, first off, we are currently able to calculate ability to pay and cash flow out of people's bank account data. Um, that's how much money you bring in versus how much money you spend and also how much money you have on your account at, at uh, different times. Uh, also, we verify income sources and IBANs. Um, according to a poll we did, the number one thing uh, our customers, that is creditors, want is to be able to reliably verify the reported um, net income of a loan applicant. And we can also um, produce all sorts of other results from bank account data, such as um, whether you're likely to own a vehicle, whether you're likely to own a house, how much you gamble, and uh, how many children you have, things like this. Uh, my favorite one that we're doing currently is um, calculating uh, which percentage of your net income you spend within the like, next 48 hours of your payday. <laughs> like, you can see how that might affect your, you know, your, um, your credit rates, you know? Um, so now I'm jumping to the um, service design part, so uh, slightly more technical. Um, we decided to run this application as containers and OpenShift. We have a private OpenShift cluster, and um, yeah, that's why we decided to go, go that way. And based on that, it's quite natural to go with a uh, microservice architecture, right? We chose Thorntail, also known as Wildfly Swarm, for the uh, backend. We've been running EAP at asiakastieto slash use for several years now, and we kind of saw Thorntail as a uh, natural evolution for, for like monolith EAP type of stuff. Um, we picked React and Node.js for our front end. We're able to go with the latest Java, so why not, right? Java 11 it is. And then our Product owner um, asked for us to build something she called joints into this service. Um, and what I mean by that is the PSD2 space is very, in terms of standards, it's very unregulated. So each and every bank will have their own API through which you download stuff. Stuff will be named differently, um, different authentication mechanisms, all that. So. We have to be able to change this stuff on the fly, and we also need to be able to uh, have partners that aggregate a set of bank APIs in order to harmonize them and to make it easy for us so we don't have to do the job of integrating to every single bank there is out there. And then 
other parts of the process should also be de detachable. For instance, what if we had a service that just wanted to download the bank account data but not utilize the calculation that we do? That has to be a detachable part of the process. Or how about what if some, some of our customers already have the bank account data so that they don't need that part, they just need to be able to call the service, the calculation part with the account data that they already have. So that also has to be a, a thing that can be separated. Now, there's obviously some interplay between all these bullets, right? So containers, microservice architecture, and then the Thorntail thing where, you, where you're actually able to build the built the stuff. So I think our uh, design philosophy got quite well aligned with, with uh, this set of technologies. And a quick word about how we work with, with the, our clients on this one, the creditors. So we broke new ground at Asiakasetu with the amount of uh, customer interest that, was, that this um, new uh, project received. Um, we had regular workshops with our pilot customers and they were able to give meaningful input that actually affected how the service turned out. Um, we did scrum, we did code review, pair programming, that kind of thing. And we were actually, and maybe this is not special for you, but for us it is, we were actually able to uh, <laughs> release the test environment to our clients before our production was live. That doesn't happen every time. Um, this is the um, application architecture of Account Insight. Um, we have a grand total of eight microservices and a database and a cache. And the production runs on just about 20 containers. Um, and let's go through the different parties uh, at this time as well. So there's our customer, the creditor. That's going to be here on the top left, the, the bank logo. Under them, there's the end user, the PSU, payment service user. And then on the bottom left, there's something called Enfuse, and that's the partner I mentioned earlier that aggregates many, many banks for us uh, through a single API. And so just to underline, this is the part that we've built, and it's all running on OpenShift. So let's go through a little bit of what, the, what each microservice does. So there's one set of microservices that's responsible for the process flow. Um, there's the, the top one called the Interface, to PS, interface PSD2 REST. Um, that's the process flow from the perspective of the, our client, the bank. Then there's the PSD2 client, which controls the process flow from the perspective of, our, for, of the end user. And then there's the PSD2 orchestrator, which controls uh, the process from the perspective of, of Asiakastieto. Now, if we wanted to change the flow somehow, you, could, you can see how this is pretty well detached now. We could, uh, if we wanted to alter it in any way, we just have to edit one or two or three of these services and not the rest of them. So pretty basic microservice stuff, but still it's um, been tested and it, it, it works. Um, then there's the calculation stuff, you know, the, the mathematics of it, and there's two services for that. Um, there's the, what we call the rule engine, so that contains all the facts that we can derive out of the raw bank account data. Um, so one, one uh, doing just math, and then there's the company matcher. Now, if you ever go into your uh, banks, like online, through, through a browser to your bank, online bank, and look at your account, you're gonna see a bunch of transactions. And if you look at the counterparty of transactions, I don't know what the case is for you guys, but when I go there, some of the names have nothing to do with the actual company that I've been. For example, if I go to a gas station, it might say something like 04220 Helsinki, and not like gas station X. So there's a huge issue on how to actually map the name of the counterparty to an actual company and the business that they do. So there's, <clears throat> so there's we built a service that, that does this matching. And that can be reused in, in any other context now as well. And finally, there's the integrations part. So like I mentioned, there, 
we might have one or several counterparties and, uh, w w when connecting to the banks. And there will be, in the current architecture, two microservices for each um, counterparty that we have. So one for each line of uh, communication. So when we are calling the banks, we are calling through the integration Enfuse or integration, you know, bank X. And when they're giving, doing the callback, we're going to receive it at the interface Enfuse. And this is how we decouple the bank integrations for, from the rest of the service. And then there's a mechanism for logging stuff for the purpose of, you know, auditing and that kind of thing. Um, that's not really um, super interesting, so we're not going to go through that very much. Um, but I think with this, it's time for the demo. Um, this is going to be a live demo, and I'll be accessing a um, oh. going to be accessing a sandbox that's built on top of a sandbox that's built on top of another sandbox <laughs> through VPN via you know mobile internet. So just in case something goes wrong, let's all agree to blame somebody else. It's not my fault. <laughs> So here we have a, um, our testing tool. Um, this is kind of mocking the, the creditor in the process. So here you can see, oops, here you can see the um, initial message that our, um, our customer would send. And we're actually going to edit this one right now to make the process slightly more simple. So they're going to call one of our endpoints. They're going to get some stuff as a response, and then they're going to forward the loan applicant to our service. And this is what the app loan applicant would, would see on our service. Now this is finished. I'm sorry, we don't have an English version for this. I don't know why you can ask the product owner or something. Um, this is for accepting the terms and conditions, and nobody ever reads those because this is just like ba bank data. It's not important. <laughs> and then there's bank selection, so we're going to go with well, this is a Finnish bank, Osuspank. Maybe the most of you don't know about this, but we're going to say our bank is Osuspank. So we're going to be forwarded to do strong customer uh, authentication, two-factor authentication for the bank. Wonder if I still remember this. And this would be two-phase. So now my phone would ring, and then I'd get a code, and I'd input it here. And mind you, these, these um, couple of last screens are the bank screens. So we have no control over, Asiakas has no control over what they see there. But basically, they're doing the customer authentication. And they're, they're going to get a list of their bank accounts here. So we're going to choose these two accounts. The, here are the balances. This is not my account. This is a test. Um, <laughs> so we're going to say, Asiakasito can access these two accounts, and we're going to click Accept. And then it's going to redirect us back to Account Insight, built by us. And we're going to be able to download the data. It's going to take a while, so we can just take the time by admiring this guy's beard. OK, we're ready already. It's faster than usual. Um, here we can review the actual raw data if we want to. So the end user can review the data if they wish. So this is just JSON, right? But here are all the um, transactions they've had for the last 12 months or something. So they can review their own data. This is a GDPR thing, I, th I think. So, but the process doesn't terminate here for, the, for our uh, customer, the creditor, right? Because they're going to want to get the calculated results as well. So we're going to take a look at the um, testing tool and say, get latest rule engine results. Boom. Yes, it worked. And we're going to, there are plenty of rules here. Like, I could scroll down. There's plenty of stuff here. But I'm going to do one that I know. Here, the largest positive transactions. Name, Tilupavloto. OK, this is Finnish, and it's also misspelled. But basically, what our service is telling us is um, there's, a, there's someone called Tilupalvelut. Um, limited company who's been sending us money over the last six months, on average, once per month. Well, this is the previous 30 days. This is the 30 days before that, and et cetera, for the last, last uh, six months. And it's telling us uh, it's been a total of 
15,000 over the last six months and an over a total of 30,000 over the last 12 months. So now if this guy had applied for credit and said they work for Tilu Palvelut Oy and their salary is something like, net salary is something like, what is that, 2,500 uh, per month, we'd be inclined to believe them, right? Okay, so that's the demo basically. Um, it's in production, we have clients there, and um, yeah. So, let's jump back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly speak about the benefits from working with OpenShift on this one. Um, the setup was really quick for each of these microservices with Thorntail, so the threshold to decouple stuff is very low. Uh, we can go from code to our test environment and even into production in less than five minutes, that's pretty good. You never wanna do that though. Um, containers and microservices lead to freedom of choice in technology. We could do Thorntail, for which I don't think we had a proper runtime environment without OpenShift. Um, we could do Java 11. Um, we have a high availability, easy to scale and automated recovery. This leads to you know, better uptimes and, and whatnot. Oh. And to, just to summarize, so these also, uh, each one of these also has a concrete business benefit. So quick setup, like I said, it saves time and time is, time is money, right? Um, lower boundary to decouple stuff leads to higher quality, hopefully. Um, quick to deploy means faster lead time, shorter feedback loop, that kind of thing. And the um, freedom of choice in technology should lead to stuff like better quality, better productivity, and even better security. And also one thing I've noticed is that when you get to work with current stuff like this, you're, not gonna, you're, you're gonna have um, motivated coders because they're able to try some kind of new stuff and keep their you know, uh, skills relevant. So, a bit of speculation on what's gonna happen next with, with the open banking stuff uh, with regard to how, how we see it. Basically, these are the things we're talking about uh, building next. Um, now, the thing I showed you was about a loan applicant getting their, their credit rating by some automated means, right? Now, what if we thought this um, the other way around? Currently, we're not, Asiakasoto is not saving the data in any way. We get it, we process it, we send it to the creditor, and then we discard it. So we don't, there's nothing uh, that we have at the end except the audit trail that it happened. What if we anonymize the tr transactions to make it you know, GDPR compliant and we save them in a database? All of this. Now, once we get a critical mass going, um, there's gonna be a bunch of stuff in there, right? Because if you look at your bank, you're probably gonna have within the last year, like, I don't know, 500 transactions, 1,000 transactions, something like this. Um, so we anonymize them and we persist them. But we try and save some relevant information like age, gender, and approximate location. Again, still keeping it uh, GDPR compliant so we can't um, single anybody out. And then with sufficient data, we can draw conclusions like, hmm, women aged 20 to 34 prefer h and to Zara in Stockholm, 77% to 23%, right? So we can do all these cross-cutting things with this big data that we have. We could also say stuff like, okay, but Zara's been gaining market share at a rate of 0.3% since um, 2015. So this is the kind of stuff we could do. And this is pretty big because this, be, this kind of data could be sold to anyone. It's basically irrefutable and uh, every business needs it. You know, taxis, hotels, grocery stores, I don't know, everybody. Another initiative would be synergy benefits by just attaching this to existing um, risk evaluation um, services. We could also have another approach where instead of you going to, a, to a apply for a loan and the um, creditor rating you to instead of having a platform within Asiakastetta where consumers come do the, the same process and then we rate them and then they can go to a, every bank with a, with a pre-calculated uh, statement saying, okay, this is this guy's trade rating. So kind of flipping the 
uh, script around that way. And finally, there's some anti-money laundering um, opportunities where we could kind of be able to track where money goes through which companies better by automated means like this. Okay, so that was about the um, future stuff we are seeing. And we're again gonna change paces here because um, it's time to go subatomic. Um, let's have a show of hands here. Um, who's heard of Quarkus? And who's um, tried Quarkus? And who's working on an actual project that's gonna be in production on Quarkus? Okay, and who's, who's already in production with Quarkus? Okay, um, just me then. So remember this slide from earlier, um, this one? It, it hasn't been accurate for quite a while. Uh, anymore. Uh, three of those microservices are actually now are running Quarkus native with one of them in all the way to production um, since mid-December. Um, now, okay, so it's not like everybody's even heard of Quarkus, so better, better not skip this next slide. What, what is it and why should you care about it? Well, it's a Kubernetes native Java net uh, framework. B um, that's supposed to reduce the, um, the size of both the Java application itself in, during runtime and its container image footprint. So basically they've rewritten parts of, for example, stuff from the Java EE specification to be more cloud native type of thing. And there are two modes you can run Quarkus on. There's the JVM mode, so regular JVM, and then you can also compile it to be a native executable. And the native executable part, which I've done the migration of, is, is not painless. It's actually, well, you'll see. So these are the pain points. Um, basically, reflection. If you use reflection in Java, you're gonna run into some issues. Um, I did it kind of um, trial and error, so it took me quite a while to really get that down. There's pretty basic stuff like um, your SSL. So if you want your HTTP clients to do HTTPS calls, you're gonna have to do some extra stuff. Now, there are guides for this on, on the Quarkus.io, but due to our special circumstances, we had to do some extra stuff with that, and that was not cool. Um, also, if you're using web service, so that's Jack's WS, that's, I, do, I couldn't get it to work, and as far as I know, it doesn't work uh, on the native mode. So I had to go and change some stuff within our legacy applications to expose stuff as REST APIs instead of web service uh, APIs. Um, then there's the fact that the application is, is booted at build time instead of you know, startup. So you boot the application during the native compilation and that runs into some issues if you're not careful. At Asiakaseto, this is how our configuration management works. During startup, we download environment-specific stuff over HTTP. Now, <laughs> that's not gonna work if you do it at build time, because you're gonna do your build so that you can run it anywhere, right? So, yeah, had to, had to fix some stuff, but the migrating to Quarkus is good for highlighting the stuff you're doing wrong, so I would definitely recommend that. And then there's logging configuration. The way we configured our logging wasn't compatible with this, so we had to do some stuff to get around it. Um, if you guys wanna chat about these pain points, I have this in much more detail, and um, you can see much more painful expressions on my face trying to you know, discuss this, so just come up to me later and we, we can have a chat. So enough with the, with the pain, let's, let's see the gains, right? So we are being promised smaller footprints, and uh, um, I did some, um, performance tests, tests on this, and uh, I'm gonna show you the results in two sides. So there's the resource utilization part that interests us, and the other is performance, right? So resource utilization first. So here, we have three deployments. The left one is the application as it is. The middle one is Quarkus and JVM, and the one on the right is Quarkus on the native compiled version. So when we were running the application as it was, its container image size was over one gigabyte. With the JVM version, it was pushed down to about half of that. And with um, the native version, 
the container image size was 200 megabytes. And the crucial thing here is that the native one is cool because neither is there a Java binary in the container, because there's no Java, it's a native application, but you don't even need a, an, a, an operating system that has to be able to kind of run Java, so it can be stripped down to very, very minimum. And then there's the middle column there, the uh, TAN column. That's the memory usage. So our microservice used to take about one gigabyte of memory after some load. Um, migrating to um, Quarkus JVM, we cut that down by like, I don't know, 75% or something. And with the native deployment where the deployment was restricted to 50 megabytes of RAM, um, the consumption was down to 41. So that's like 20 to one, that's, that's pretty good. Um, and then the final column is the CPU. So out of the box, we had a um, CPU utilization of 350 millicores. Now, this is just reference numbers, basically. And with a JVM, it went down to 150, so that's about 60%, I suppose. And then going to the native one, it went up slightly to 170, and that's because the memory is so low that it has to constantly garbage collect. So there's actually a space-time trade-off going on. If you give it some more memory, it'll utilize less, um, less CPU. So you can actually optimize for that kind of thing. Okay, people are falling asleep, so let's, let's move forward. So performance. Um, the first elephant in the slide is the 60% bar there, isn't it? So Thorntail used to take one minute to boot up, um, and migrating to Quarkus JVM, we took that down by 90%, and going to um, the native, another 90% or so. So currently, uh, the application is starting in about 0.4 seconds. Now, it's not good enough for serverless, but uh, the reason is our um, configuration management. Like I said, it downloads stuff over HTTP during startup, so it's not going to be like 10 milliseconds or whatever. And then there's throughput. I was actually surprised to see that the throughput uh, went up uh, quite significantly. Um, the throughput was 3.3 calls per second for, for Thorntail. And I'm talking sequential calls. So you make one call, and when it returns, you make the next one. So no parallel calls. So the throughput went up by like 50% for the JVM version, and then slightly down because of the um, restricted memory uh, on, on the native uh, deployment. So some thoughts on the native migration. I'll mention that JVM migration was extremely easy because, well, from Thorntail to Quarkus, the dependency changes map quite well. So that's, um, these comments are for the, for the native version. Hmm, I think there's something missing here. Okay, so <laughs> the pain is real with legacy applications. So I wouldn't recommend everyone to go and migrate all of your you know, legacy apps onto Quarkus Native right away because you're going to be in a world of pain that way. Maybe use it on some fairly modern thing you, you know, built last year or do it on green, Greenfield projects. But the JVM Quarkus thing is definitely for everybody and I would suggest uh, trying it out. There's stuff I didn't mention like uh, a testing framework and a de development mode that's super useful and uh, we can chat that about that later. And with that, I think I'm gonna wrap up. Any questions? Silence, like everybody, Finnish audience. everybody can smell that lunch being piped in here. So um, thank you very much. It, and um, it's wonderful to see Quarkus being <laughs> advocated for. And this is also, I think, um, I just I wanted to say, when we ask people to give us their case studies and their stories, we're not asking for the, the cleaned up version. We like to hear your pain points and get the feedback. That's really one of the wonderful things about having a community event. We're not trying to sell you anything. We're trying to share the stories and the war stories. So um, thank you very much for that.